Okay. So we started yesterday, Vemo Hashem Elav Misam Pela Adam. And we saw the whole issue of Shemitahs. Oh, but there are, aren't. And the, and the Maskana of the Arizal, and that's the way that everybody follows in the end, is that this idea of there being a previous Shemitah is just a spiritual thing. And it's talking about the world of Tov. What the Arizal described as a world that broke and shattered. So that's called the previous Shemitah. ולכן פתחה התורה בבית, בראשית, לומר שכבר הייתה שמיטה אחת ועכשיו היא שמיטה שנייה. אבל פירוש האריזה על דאין הכוונה לומר שהיה עולם גשמי, it's not that there was some kind of physical world, the way that, again, that Ari Kaplan, we talked a lot about this uh, yesterday, he wanted to, uh, to use this to solve his issues with the age of the universe. אין הכוונה לומר שהיה עולם גשמי, it's not talking about a physical world, כמו העולם הזה, like this world. This reality that we live in that has a physical dimension to it. That it had a heaven and earth that were physical, and all the categories of life. Because all of this only exists in our Shemitah. I, what do we get from this? So, what the Sefer Atmuno was really trying to say, and what, what did how it aligns with the Rizal's Torah, with his teachings, is that it's talking about the world of Tohu, which is a spiritual world, which is a spiritual state. These are the seven kings of Tohu, Shemetu, that, that died, it says, in the Torah. This is all talking about spiritual Sfirot. <coughs> what we do get out of this is why this world, why all the actions in this world are very uh, difficult. And this he takes and he puts in the Tanya. He says that because according to the Shemitot, we're in the Shemitah of Din, Shemitah of Pachad, as he calls it. We definitely, we definitely uh, are affected. Except, except, this is very important, if it's called Shemitah Tapachad, so Pachad is in the mind. He, he repeats this two or three times in the Tanya. That, Irat Hashem Belibo, U Pachad Hashem Be Mocho. He says that Pachad is something that's in the intellect, it's not something in the, in the, in the emotions. <coughs> so he's not coming and saying, when he says that we're in the Shemitah Pachad, he says, in any case, we're talking about something spiritual intellectually. We're not talking about something spiritual that's necessarily emotive. It doesn't have to turn into the fact that the person should feel that everything in this world is out to get him. That's not the meaning. Kashim v'ra'im means that it's very easy for the evil in a person's heart to rise up, like read in today's Tanya, to rise up into the mind. And so if I have any kind of uh, grievance with somebody, so it's very easy for that grievance to awaken from time to time and go into my, into my mind. That's called the Hirurei Avera. And that's what it means, it's Kashim Vereim. You have to do a lot of work to, get, to clean your mind. And uh, it's probably the, the most important thing that you know, the people that, who, are, who, are, who are open to media, I'm not talking about a cell phone where you can somehow control it. I'm talking about if you see TV or you listen to the radio, so your mind is bombarded by negativity all the time. So it's very, very hard for these people at all to ever think a good thought um, or to ever clear their mind from all the negative impact that uh, it's being bombarded by. So now we're getting to our point, that there were two souls, Mishmita Rishona, two Neshamas of Tohu, as they're called. They come from the world of Tohu. They come from the world of Tohu, that before the Tohu, they came from the world of Tohu, and they came from and the, these are two people who have a common, a common, call it, source, and therefore they're very close to one another, so close to one another, in fact, that one is the mentor of the other. Who are they? Vehem Chanoch Moshe. The first one was Chanoch, what the Goyim call Enoch. I don't know why. And the second one was Moshe Rabbeinu. So Chanoch, he's Moshe Rabbeinu's Malach. He says, uh, just like the Baal Shem Tov had uh, the Baal Achai, the Achia Shiloni, so Moshe Rabbeinu, his Malach was Chanoch. And he, he helped him 
understand how to function in this world, because they're not from this world, as it were. They're from, they're spiritually, they come from a different place, a place of chesed. It's the place of Torah, it's a huh? place of Torah. Okay, it's called Olam Atol, but it's, it's Chesed. It's the Shemitah of Chesed. Okay. Like, Mina Maim Ishitil, that's what you said. Maim is Chesed. Mm -hmm. So the, the, they, don't, they don't understand. What, what it really means is, is why, why, did the, why are we better off than the world of Tol? Because the, the spheres in the world of Tol didn't know how to deal with the negative thought that they had. They didn't have the wherewithal. They didn't have the ability to fight it off even. But we, because we're from Din, because we're from Pachad, we know how to fight these things. Maybe we can do a good job. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, he's susceptible to, to all the evil in the world. He, you, see, you see how he acts. He acts almost like a, like a teenager. Well, he is a teenager. But when he goes to kill the Egyptian, he doesn't, he doesn't realize, for some reason, he doesn't realize that this is a very dangerous thing you're doing. And it may ruin... It, all your prospects for what you wanted to do in the world. And what did he want to do in the world? He's not happy. Um, what did he want to do in the world? He wanted to save the Jewish people. So what happened? What, what ended up happening? He was thrown out of Egypt. He was forced to leave Egypt for, for about uh, 60 years. 60 or 40 years. Yeah. So what kind, of, what kind of beginning is that? That was today's Chita. So these two souls, they're very similar, and it says about Chanoch ve'italech Chanoch et Elokim. No matter if we're italech et Elokim, we're shmita rishona. That whole verse, ve'italech Chanoch et Elokim, something, 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 ve'enenu. It has eleven words, and it's eleven times ve'enenu. Even this word ve'enenu, what, what, what word does it come from? From Ayn. That's how we usually call the shmita of Tov, that it's Ayn. So really, they're their, their, state of, their state of their psyche is that they don't really know how to function in this world. Their, their, their ikar is ayin. They're not yesh. They don't have a yesh. So in, in, in Hasidus it's explained that that when Hashem showed himself to Moshe at the Sne, what he wanted to do was, he said, ga, ga, What are the words? I don't remember it properly. Hide. I don't know why. Shall not have a lecha? Take it, but before that, he says something to him. He said he returned by Yasser the Rot. Ten. The Yasser the Rot. And the Omer, Alti Krav Halom. Don't come near. Halom is understood to be Malchus. Shal na lecha ma'al regilecha ki ha'makom asher ta omed alav admat kodashu. So he says, take your shoes off your, off your, your feet. <coughs> the shoes represent a person's connection to, to this reality. <coughs> so he says, the way that you're connected, nothing good is going to come from it. You can't face Paro this way. I want you to come to Malchus, I want you to, but this, this is not going to work the way that you have it now. That's how it's explained in Chassidus, that I want you to see. Even the Medras says that back then, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, uh, he turned his face not to see. And then he says that later he asked Hashem to see him. He said, what I wanted, you didn't want. Now that you want, I don't want. There's not things with him. He's saying there was an eight ratzon, dafka from where you were then, you could have seen. From the, from the Shemitah of Toh, where you were before, you could have seen. But now that you've already, Baruch Hashem, he, he changed, he took his feet off, his shoes off, he entered into this world, he began to understand how this world functions and so on. Now that you're here in this world, you can't see. It's not a game. Before, where you were, there you could see Hashem. Here you can't see Hashem. That's, that's, Hanoch ended that way. Because he was taken by Hashem, he was he was engrossed so much into Hashem. Well, I mean, remember Moshe was hanging out with Yisro, and Yisro was very much tall. I mean, I think I think the message of the Sna is sustainability, which is <coughs> more connected with Tikkun. I mean, it's a, you know it burns, but it's not consumed. Is is a is a mm -hmm. that's, that's sounds tikkun. like Tikkun, not yeah. not like uh, tall. 
No, Yitro is considered to be the Klipa, not the, not just the, he's in, definitely in the world of Tikkun, he's not in the world of Tov. <laughs> he's not the Nain. He's the opposite. He's almost the, he's the biggest Yesh there is. I, they, they had a certain time when they were in the same frame of mind because Yitro gave up on everything that he had done. He was, he was ostracized. So when you're ostracized, you're like dead. Mm-hmm. That's, that's called the cherem is like being dead. So that during that time, they, right, why why couldn't the, his daughters come to the well? Because they, they were needy, the whole family. So at that time, they had some connection. The Yitro usually represents a state of, uh, of, of very much in the, he's very much in the world. He's very much uh, at home. Uh, <coughs> so, by Moshe it says the verse is that I took him out of the waters and the waters represent the first Shemitah and the first Shemitah is like Chesed if this Shemitah is To uh, this, sorry, this Shemitah is Pachad Din so the first one was Chesed and that's the water and that's where Moshe Rabbeinu was taken from the main reason why they came down is to, to, is to rectify the worlds. So there in the Chesed, in the Shemitah of, of, of Tohu, it's really the Ein. That's what's natural for them. That's like this word ve'inenu, ve'yichanoch. That the main thing in his life is the ayin. It's turning things into ayin. That's why it says in the end, all the tzaddikim, they take the yesh and they, they turn it back to the ayin. Like they're bringing it back to its source. In, in, the, in, the, in the Baal Shem Tov's picture of things, it means going back to your keter. The keter is the ayin. That's, that's where you go up to. What's above the mind. The mind is tikkun. The mind is already here in this world. It's all about the yesh. It's all about what there is. Ve'ish Moshe anav me'od. Ve'gam ra'a sham neshamot gvot shelemala mimenu k'mo chanoch ve'lemech. So now he has a few others. Except, why did he not mention lemech before? <coughs> because lemech wasn't his, uh, his, his teacher. Only chanoch was. But lemech, the father of Noach, is also considered to be... Uh, uh, one of these souls from the world of Tov. So they had this ability to come down into this Shemitah, into this reality, and to fix this one also. It's an amazing thing. It's a rereading of the whole thing. It says that really, it was all in Shiflus. The whole, the whole world was in Shiflus. It's like saying that the water is in the middle. They're like representing the switch from the Shemitah of, of, uh, of uh, Tohu to the Shemitah of, uh, of Tikkun. And where do we see this? It's what Chazal say, that a pain Tohu. That the first 2,000 years of the world, the world was relatively Tohu. There wasn't really Yesh yet. And when you don't have a Yesh, then it's Shafal. You, you're, you're lowly. You don't hold from yourself. So they were, who held from themselves? The, the descendants of Cain, of course. But they were, they, they were Kaniti, that's a really yesh. But the descendants of Shet, so they were in the state of uh, a lot of Shiflut. Shet is like the first and last letters of Shiflut. But these Shemitahs, when, when, what year, I mean, let me ask a technical question, what year is this? The Torah was given in 2448, so that was already 400 years of the Torah. It says that Nefesh Asher Asul the first time there were converts, was the year 2000. Okay. That's how Chazal explained it. The, the, from Avram and on, it's already Tikkun. Right. Uh, 2,000 years of Torah. But the first 2,000 years, the world wasn't, it wasn't yet formed, really. Meaning, again, it, we're confused because of the souls of, or the generations of Cain, Cain's descendants. I mean, we talked about this once, and it suddenly hit me that uh, who was the man who, le- who lived the longest? So it's, it's, it's meant to shut up. that's what's documented. But it's because we don't know the, the, the length of time that the kind's descendants uh, lived. But if you do the math, and uh, most of the Midrashim agree with this, uh, Kain was the person who lived the longest by far. He lived close probably to 1,600 years. Yeah, but he lost count. <laughs> so it doesn't count. Kain Mr. Shell probably can't celebrate every birthday every year. Kain, it could be that he doesn't even consider it anything. 
But uh, Kain, in fact, there's a good reason to say that the whole Mabul was to destroy Kain's descendants. Not because he saved the Noach's, and he left from Kain only the little bit that was through Naamah, through Noach's wife. But she was a descendant of Kain. She was the last descendant of Kain. But, uh, but uh, the rest of the world was in Shiflus. The, the rest of the descendants of Shet were actually in Shiflus, and people who destroyed the world were, were Kain. And there's a question, so why are you destroying also the tzaddikim? He says, no, Tushalach was the last one. And really everybody else had already joined forces with Kain. I mean, the descendants of Shet, in the end, they joined forces with Kain. But to get rid of that, Hashem had to, had to finish the world. So since he knows, it's like these people, they understand what real tohu is, so they won't let the world go back to real tohu. The same thing, just as Chanoch and his descendants are what saved the world from being destroyed entirely. So Moshe Rabbeinu does the same thing for the Jewish people. That he also, he saves them just before they go into Ayn, because he understands what it means to, to become Tohu, what it means to stop being in this world. So that connects with what you said, that really the, mat, the real 2,000 years of Torah begin in 2,448. But then it's not a full 2,000 years. You can say that sort of in overtime. Uh, that saying that Avram did this is, is a little... Yeah. A prequel. Yeah. So, okay, so all this is good. So what is the difference between Toh and Tikkun? What are we talking about? What's going on here? What do you mean, uh, if it was in Toh, then it's going to be destroyed? If it's, if it's not in Toh, it can be sustained. What's the difference between Toh and Tikkun? What, what did Maishu Rabbeinu, what did Chanoch do that was so important? רק העשר ספירות היו מבחינת נקודות, רוצה לומר נקודות החסד, נקודת הגבורה וכולי. So the big difference is that there's no, there's no אסקלדוס. Um, uh, uh, so there's no ability of things to come together to form some composite, more complex picture. Rather, everything is separate. The big thing about Toh is that everything is separate. דהיינו שלא נתחלקו הספירות לפרטי פרטיות באורך ורוחב, כי אם הייתה נקודה אחת בדרך כללי בקיצור מופלג, זו חסד וזו גבורה. So the first thing is that in Tohu there's no differentiation, there's no higher resolution. Uh, everything is very simplistic. So Keter is just Keter, and Chachma is just Chachma, and Vina is just Vina. <clears throat> but each one of them is described as points. That's why the world of Toh is called Olam Nikudim, the world of points. What does it mean that it's points? That it, it can never, it can never connect. It's like it's sort of like teenager gases, relative to a to a liquid, relative to a solid. That the molecules are just separate, and you can't bring them together. You can't form anything uh, anything real out of them. So they just float around. They they can't connect. Can you create a, a, a composite? Can you create a mixture? Not a mixture. Uh, what's it called? An alloy. No. no what is, is it? Higher than mixture. No. Well, it's more connected. More than an alloy? I do. Yeah, you do. But you can put it in a deep freeze of minus a thousand, then it will become solid. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. It'll be solid, but still won't be. It won't be connected. The molecules won't, still won't connect, but just be frozen in time and space, right? It's not. They don't connect when you do that. It's, there's no bonds forming. So first of all, there was no. The, everything was very, very separate. So that each thing, each thing was a was a point. It's absolute. It, it, it was very absolute. It's a general principle, it's a general point. And it doesn't include anything. Each one is a separate thing. And the other thing is that their sequence was one under the other. When they were one under the other, all you can see is you can see the guy above you, you can see the guy below you. 
you can never see left and right. If you can't see left and right, you're missing a dimension. And to really connect things, you have to have at least two dimensions. It's also like um, um, in interactions between people. That if you only, if I step on somebody's foot in the, in, on the bus, and that's my whole interaction with them, so there's very little connection created. But if we're sitting one next to another, yeah, and we begin to talk at least about two things, so those two things begin, begin to form an, a, a connection. And therefore, chesed each one of the sefirot is by itself, each one is, a, is, a, is in its own separate vessel, as the Arizal describes it. They couldn't connect to one another. They couldn't inter-include. He says the same thing. The fact that you're calling them nekudot, you're saying that they're one under the other, they're, they're, they're two facets of the same problem. That there's no connection. There's no inter-inclusion. They can't include one another. To really connect with somebody, something similar in the other person to you. If you can't find something in the other person that's similar to you, so there's no connection. So here, in the world of Tikkun, there is cooperation. They connect to one another, and they create something bigger. And remember, we talked about this when we talked about Migdal Bavel. I said that in Migdal Bavel, there was, no cooper- there was no real cooperation. It was just like China. A totalitarian regime. Whereas America, the whole American model, is built on cooperation. The whole Western model is built on cooperation. <clears throat> China is really 500 years backwards. Except nobody, nobody realizes that because they, because they make, uh, because they assemble stuff. They can't create the stuff. It's okay, the stuff they assemble doesn't stay together. <laughs> so what, one of the interesting things is... Put them in the freezer. What? Put them in the freezer. They are in the freezer anyway. They're, they're like in the state of Nikudim. They're in the state of To. Whether they understand it or not, that's, that's where they are. And one, one of the things that surprised me the most, I didn't realize this, is that they've given up on cars, on, combust- on combustion engine cars. They've given up completely. It's over. They, ga- they gave up. Why? Because it doesn't look like a, uh, an engine, a combustion engine is so difficult to, 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 to make. But it turns out it's seriously difficult. And it took GM 30 or 40 years back in the early 20th century to create a corporate structure that could build these things. The supply chains, everything, it's really difficult. And so they've been trying for 20 years and they realized that they're not forming the right corporate structure no matter what they do. And you can't, you can't, um, you can't import corporate structure. You can't import a, co- a corporate culture. You can't do that thing. It has to fit the people that are working there. So GM pray, paid a high price. Everybody who, who basically went off into the car industry went from GM, from Ford, and, and basically copied, but it worked for Western people. It doesn't work for them. So they've been unable to create a corporate structure for 100,000 people that can actually cooperate. And so they failed completely. They're, they're, they've finished. So now what are they doing? They said, an engine we don't know how to build, but we're very good with, uh, with simpler things. So they're going full for, force into the electrical vehicles because it's much, much simpler. <coughs> but not to mention that they can't create anything more. more. I mean, that's nothing. Go, go make a plane. I have to understand, what we have in the Western world is because this is tikkun, because there is this ability to cooperate, to work together. So it's not yet a partzuf completely. It's not just China, it's Asian culture in general. There, there were plane no, crashes. Korea is doing a good job. Korea is a little bit of an exception, but there they were, they were plane crashes because in the corporate culture, the co pilots. Right, that's the, Korea, Korean problem. I'm saying, but, but they, they the were they were yeah. subservient to the point that when the pilot was crashing the plane. He said, Amen. Yeah, and he would, <laughs> they would not speak up. And they, they, they went to significant retraining on that. So that's why Korea is a little bit different. And, and they, you, they, and the problem was so extreme that they noticed it. And you know that, that by, uh, by the, you know the problem with the Airbuses. 
with the European culture. Well, that you can't have a joystick, and they took away the steering wheel. Yeah, yeah. They took away. There's no. There's no. Uh, whatever you call <laughs> so this. You can't thing. see what the other guy's doing. You not just can't see. You can't feel. Yeah. The whole point was that they were mechanically connected to one yeah. another. So you have a pilot and a co-pilot, and they have as if two steering wheels. I don't know what they're called. I don't remember what they're called. Yeah. So, um, but they're mechanically connected. So if one does one thing, the other person feels it. So this is a huge deal in psychology about the difference between European and American cultures. And by the way, the British are like the Europeans. They're not like the Americans. And the Russians, surprisingly, are like the Americans. This, this came to me as a huge surprise. And most of the psychologists in Russia see it the way that the Americans see it. What's the difference? The question is, what are you using? Are you using your, what we call your interpersonal intelligence or your intrapersonal intelligence? The Europeans were always about intrapersonal. And that you're, you're thinking in yourself and you, want to, and you want everybody to be quiet around you. Don't bother me. So that's why they took away this thing because it bothered them that the other guy was moving and, and he's forcing me to do. But in America, that's what it's all about. Like I want to, that's like a football, not like rugby. <laughs> football, when you think about it, is the ultimate team sport. It's really weird. But you see these playbooks. Well, the playbooks really are the parts of him. If you think right. about 11, people, 11 men on a field, they can be arranged to a function, accomplish a certain message, and the arrangement changes according to the goal. I mean, it's loud to let's That's my issue. So they have this interpersonal intelligence, um, marching bands. There's no marching bands in Europe. I've never seen one. Maybe they copied them since then. But the whole thing of a marching band is ridiculous when you think about it. But Americans love it. Cheerleading, which is another thing. There's all these interpersonal things where the goal is to get a lot of people to cooperate in a certain way. So that's that's the way psycho the psychology. That's why Apple works, and that's why you don't have the marching action. bands in Asia. That everybody does the exact same thing. Yeah. They don't have they, they don't they, have a team doing different things that are working together. Cheerleading is the place I think you see it the most. It's like football. I mean, that's why they do it at the same time because. Cheerleading was people who were smaller and couldn't you know, get on the field and do what the, <laughs> what the football players were doing. But basically they're doing the same thing. And in the end, you always see that, that it's really a cooperation between them because each one is independent. Because at the end, it's only when it breaks apart, when the cheer breaks apart, each person does their own thing. It's like really weird. you, know, you got to see it. I don't think you've ever seen it, right? No, you're missing out. Oh, shit, I'm missing. <laughs> Yeah, I don't see so, in, in so, the, so the interesting thing is that in, in, in modern psychology, there's an understanding that you need both in order to create the, the, the identity of the person. Meaning, these two intelligences, interpersonal and intrapersonal, they have to work in conjunction in order to create a healthy sense of self, of what the person is. Because you have to both, and that's why we send kids to school and we don't homeschool them. That's why there's not much homeschooling in America. There is, but there's very little. But it, it, it's very interesting that in Russia, there's not at all. And nobody even dreams of this. It's like, what are you talking about? Not to, it's in, the, these two cultures, they created the most powerful social structures that we know. So the Russian failed completely, because it, it really, but it tried to do the same thing. It tried to get people to maximize their potential and work in, 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 in cooperation. That didn't work. Because <laughs> it had other problems. You could say the Americans also doesn't work for other reasons, but it, it creates corporate culture that can really develop very complex things. And that's why China is failing in all these things. It can't do it. It's not like it's not the work of one engineer. You've got thousands and thousands of engineers working on a problem, and there's a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. And uh, China just does, doesn't have the culture to be able to, to do it. So they're never going to catch up. It's not, like, it's not a question of, oh, in 20 years. And in certain things, which are very simple, they'll do a good job. Or they can copy. Right, that's what they do. They copy. But there are certain things you can't even copy. Yeah. And you can't copy how to make a, a, an Intel uh, CPU. You just can't copy it. It's just too complex even just, <laughs> just to try to copy it. You can't. Because the, 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 the manufacturing process is so complex that they can't get to it. So it's interesting what, what they're... What, anyway, that's Tohu. So we, we have an example of China. China is Tohu.
This is just exactly what it is. It's 500 years behind the rest of the world. Like they're sitting in the time of the Tower of Babylon. That the only way that they can get stuff done is by totalitarian regime. It's like that's, that's why they're holding on to, their, uh, to the way they're working. That's why America is trying to take them apart that way. They're trying, they're, what they're, the, the real question that came up in my mind last week was, what about India? Where is India in all this? Because India is not totalitarian. It's democratic, as it were. But, so why isn't it bigger than America? It should be that, the billion people. So the answer I came up with is that, this is not, that America is not yet the world of Tikkun. It's, it's a stage in between. Why? Because apparently democracy and capitalism are only good for a limited amount of people. You can't, a billion people is too much for capitalism. There's no country in the world, let's say you take the whole EU together. So again, it's about 300, 400 million people. And I don't know how much the cooperation is really that good between them, but let's say that it's, it's like one civilization, it's one thing. And America did is 350 million, I think it's at its peak. Maybe you could go 10% more, maybe 20% more. But it seems to be that when you get to 1 billion, it just doesn't work. You can give people democracy, but it's too, democracy doesn't know how to handle that, those numbers. So it's a theory, I don't know if it's true or not. But so saying that each model that you have can only handle a certain amounts. So of Mashiach is like somebody who has such good inter, interpersonal relations that he knows how to build a model that can get 7 billion people. It's, a, it's like the question, why don't we get rid of nation states altogether? Simply because we don't know how to run something bigger than a nation state. Nobody knows what to do. China's a bad model. India's a terrible model. We don't have any more countries like those are the two biggest. And after that, everything is 300 million and less. So those we know how to run, sort of. But we just don't know. So this is the real question here. Maishu Rabbeinu is coming to, to, to and saying, if I'm going to build the people here, the way the you Pharaoh have it set up, it's total. This is going to, this is, this is our end. This is the end of the, it's not life. Because everything is really separate. It's not really cooperation. Okay. We're stopping. We're stopping.